Good morning, church. I'd invite us to stand as we begin. But you can say hi to your neighbor, not the person who's seated next to you, so that during worship you're not distracted. <laughs>
it's all around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Shout. Let your kingdom come, pour your spirit out. Manifest, manifest your love. Manifest, manifest your love. All It's all around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around, all around, all around. Everywhere I look, your love is all around. Let the people shout Let your kingdom come Pour your spirit out Manifest, manifest your love Manifest, manifest your love from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So for anyone who 
just wants to be reminded that God loves them. This is our prayer, that you will know how deep his love is. You will, yeah, but also you will be reminded that he is the one who's called you, he's called us to himself, and he's the one who is holding us fast, amen? Faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter will prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold. are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but by him that such a cost he will hold Justice has been satisfied, He will hold me fast. Race with Him to endless life, He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to sight, when He comes at last, He will hold me fast. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, my name is Priya. Habari zenu? Zuri, kidogo? Well, I have a beautiful verse um, that Jesus reminds us that even if you are here feeling heavy laden, if you feel that life is a bit too much right now, Jesus speaks to us. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Welcome, church. I am, we're happy to see you, and thank you so much, worship team, for leading us. I would like to welcome anyone here who is new or new-ish. Could you raise your hand, not so we can embarrass you, but so that we can welcome you. Is there anyone here? Karibuni. Um, I would like to remind you, if you are new, or if you're interested in any of the, anything related to our church, that there is a welcome desk uh, behind the church, and afterwards you can go there to ask for more information, or sign up for any of the ministries or home groups um, as part of LVC. There's going to be a baptism service coming up on the 3rd of March for those who wish to be baptized, and um, whether you're it's your child or as an adult, please register at the welcome desk. We also have a baby dedication service on the 17th of March. And again, you can sign up for that at the welcome desk. LVC's 10th year anniversary celebrations slash Easter Sunday are on the 31st of March. And we'd like you to join us in celebrating God's faithfulness. There will be food and fun activities to mark this day. So remember, that's um, on the 31st of March. We also need volunteers to lead worship. It doesn't sound like that because today's worship has been so beautiful. But we cannot count on them every single Sunday. So we ask that if God calls you um, to help lead us in worship, whether it's through singing or playing an instrument, we invite you to come and sign up at the, worship, at the, <laughs> at the welcome desk. Could the ushers please come up, please? We ask that you come to take the offering, and we invite those who can to give. As the ushers are collecting offering, I'd like us to stand and sing the next song. Stand up literally and spiritually. King 
of glory shall reign eternally to those who overcome it, a crown of life shall be the King of glory shall reign eternally. Let's uh, pray to release the children to Sunday school. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you and to learn of you, that we might be transformed. We pray for each child here who is going into Sunday school and for the youth that they would learn to love you more. Would you guide the teachers, speak through them, Lord, that our children would grow to be yours. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us adore Him. Behold. 
me in prayer? <clears throat> God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come before you this morning as a congregation to adore you. We praise you, our Father, who goes before us and gives us rest. Jesus, you who sits at the right hand and intercedes for us, you became our righteousness while we were still sinners and died for us. Holy Spirit, who teaches us all things and leads us unto all truth. Yahweh, you reign forever, above all gods, creator of the heavens and earth. Heaven is your throne and earth your footstool. Yet who is mere man that you are so mindful of him? We glorify you as there is none like you and there never will be. Your kingdom come on earth and your will be done on here on earth as it is in heaven. We praise you, Jehovah, our God reigns. Be glorified. We are blessed to be your children. You have called us your own and drawn us with cords of loving kindness. You have been compassionate towards each one of us. It is your desire that none perish, but all come to believe in you and have eternal life. You have disciplined us as a loving father, but not for us to be in despair, but that you may redeem us. We call upon you to cleanse our hearts from all sin, intentional and unintentional. When we come to confess our sins, you are faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know when we call upon your name, you will answer us. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. We have many needs, and we boldly bring this before you for you do listen to us. You are the father to the fatherless and the protector of the widows. We call upon your name on their behalf and ask for your presence to be continuously with them. We pray for those among us who are struggling in their health. May you give them the healing they desire and strengthen them as they trust in you. We pray for those struggling with sin and all kinds of addictions. Lord, show them your light that they may experience your love like never before. Like the prodigal son, may they have clarity of mind to come back to you and know you will embrace them. We pray for those raising children. It can be tough during these challenging times. We ask for your wisdom and that our lives will be a good example and that we will pass on your truths to the next generation. We pray for those with difficult decisions to make. May they seek your truth and reveal to them what steps to take, whether to move right or left. We pray for all who are serving you in various capacities in their vocations, for those in ministries, in the marketplace, in their homes. Restore to them the joy of your salvation and strengthen their arms and feet to unashamedly proclaim the good news wherever they are. We bring before you those who are seeking income to support themselves and families. We ask you for open opportunities that will cause an inflow that will give them more than enough. May they be reminded that if you provide for the birds food and clothe the flowers, they are more valuable than they, the animals or the plants, and you are concerned about them. We pray for the brokenhearted and those grieving. Bring them comfort and be their refuge and a very present help in this time of need. We have those who have been faithfully waiting upon your promises to be fulfilled in their lives. Lord, may they not grow weary. Renew their hope to keep trusting you to fulfill that which you have promised. No matter the circumstances, they can lean on you. We thank you for those who are experiencing you in a fresh way, thriving in their businesses and personal lives. We rejoice in their successes and are encouraged by their testimonies. We know the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we know you have protected us by the power of your name. Nothing will separate us from you. We can never be snatched from you who holds us in your grip, our good shepherd. We pray for the nations of the world and remember our country, Kenya. Lord, help us keep your word, which is life. We repent we have not walked in your ways and have chosen our own path. Forgive us and give us a heart to seek after you, to live for you wholeheartedly. May our leaders make decisions that show your heart of love, mercy, and justice. 
Thank you for the beautiful land you have granted us. May all flourish in it. We pray for the church and ask that we will love one another and that we will be one. May we be protected from the evil one. May we grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and share the hope we have with those around us. We pray for those in leadership and in various roles in our church and ask for your hand to rest upon you, upon them as they seek after you and serve this body. Sanctify us with your truth. All sufficient one, we submit ourselves unto you, praying all this in your most holy name that is above all. Amen. Morning, church. My name is Gabriel, and today I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, from verse 12 to 27, which says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not exist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body one eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body one ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And that is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning. Uh, if we have never met, my name is Joshua. Privileged to serve as one of the pastors here. Um, Thank you, thank you, Gabe, for, for reading uh, that word. Let's appreciate Gabe. <laughs> as, um, I love us to pray even as we turn to uh, God's word. Our Lord, our God, we are grateful for who you are. We are grateful for what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, now to draw near to you. Help us, Lord, to be found faithful. We pray that, Lord, you will bless us now through your word. God, we ask you to rebuke us, encourage us, challenge us, comfort us, and show us more of Christ and his glory. Help us to have a desire, not just to be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. And so that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have been here for a while, um, for the last like two or three years, um, you probably know we began a conversation about um, church membership. We took a short break, but we are planning to, resuming, uh, to resume that uh, hopefully this year. Uh, we are still having discussions around it. And we are hoping to see, we are trying to figure out how we are going to uh, formalize it. Now granted, this subject, friends, of church membership has been misused and abused by churches. You see, its primary role ceased to be about the spiritual growth of believers and became an issue of preferential treatment 
where if one is a church member, they get a proper treatment from the elders and the pastors. If one is not a church member, so some churches, people are motivated to give or to, achieve, or to gather regularly because they know there's this preferential treatment from the leaders of the church. One was concerned, will the pastor bury me if I die? So people are concerned about dying than even living. Will the pastor officiate my wedding? And so friends, these are the challenges that churches have experienced over time about the issue of church membership. And this in some ways has led to a misconstrued idea of who the church is or what the church is. You see, although, friends, this subject of church membership has been abused, we are convinced it does not mean it's important. We believe church membership plays an important role in the life of the church. You see, church membership, friends, is not essential for salvation because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But we believe it is essential for the life and health of the church. Just the same way, there are some things that I do with my wife. For example, Valentine is coming. I can take her for a death or give, not death, debt, <laughs> and give her flowers. But you see, that does not mean that if I don't do that, we are not married. Yes, we are already married, but me doing these things are very essential for my marriage. So I hope today that I will use my feeble attempts, friends, to point you to the infallible word of God to show us that this church membership is biblical, but it is also practical. You see, the subject of church membership might not be explicit in the scriptures, but it has been implied everywhere. Just the same way there is no the word Trinity in the scriptures, Oh, but the subject of Trinity has been implied everywhere. You see, the reason why we need to go back to the scriptures to seek the words of God, it's because the means of grace that God has ordained in matters of faith and Christian practice is through the word. So for us to have a proper understanding of what this church membership thing is, we need to have a clear understanding of what is the church. It's just like for us to say, if we need to have a proper understanding of who a Christian is, we need to have a proper understanding of who Christ is, because Christians are people who follow Christ. So Christ really defines then how we live as Christians. So let's remind ourselves of the definition of the church. A few weeks ago, we said that the church is the people of God under God's word. These are people of God redeemed by the blood of God to serve God and others. You see, in the New Testament, like we stated, there's no category of a believer who was not plugged into a church, who was not part of a church. So when one was saved, they were baptized and they were required to join a church, an assembly of people who have been united to Christ and they're united with each other on the basis of the fact that they have believed in Jesus. So when one is saved then, they were baptized, they join the church, and they become members of one body. And that is what we read in 1 Corinthians 12 too. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and, were made, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We see there are so many of examples in the scriptures from Acts, from Acts and 1 Timothy 1. When believers were saved, they were baptized and added into the church. For example, case in point, Acts chapter 2 verse 41 says this. So, those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Then, uh, chapter, verse 47, rather, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. And then we observe 16, verse 5, it says, this, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they were increased in numbers daily. So from the scriptures, we can see when people were born again, 
They were supposed to be part of the church. They, were, they joined a church. So there was no long range of Christian. You see, there's this story that is told of a preacher who's always, who was always standing at the door and to, to shake people's hands. One day he grabbed the hand of this gentleman and he pulled him aside. And the pastor said to him, you need to join the army of the Lord. And then the guy replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord. But the pastor asked, how come I don't see you every Sunday? I see you only on Christmas and Easter's. And the gentleman whispered, it's because I'm in the secret service. You see, in the early church, there was no such kind of a Christian. Yes, you entered the faith individually and personally, but you live the faith corporately and publicly. People just didn't disappear into their own pursuit of Jesus. Rather, they were added to churches because Christianity is a team sport. It is not an individual sport. So they were added to churches. They were added to a team. What was the team? The church. So once you become a member of that church, you devoted yourself to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and breaking of bread and prayer. You see, sometimes because of church hurt, because there's a lot, I was listening to a podcast about church hurt, and so many people have been hurt by the church. And because of that, one of the ladies in that podcast said this, I don't need to be part of a church to follow Jesus. But that's not biblically true. It's like saying, I don't have, I don't have to be married to be a husband or a wife. Because the means of grace that God has ordained for an individual, for a believer to grow in their faith is through the church, not the building. The church, the assembly of God's people who have gathered together to worship and glorify God. That is the means of grace that God has ordained for us to be edified. So church membership is simply saying, I am committed to Christ and his people. You see, we live in a world that promotes a low commitment culture. We can see that in marriages, we can see that in workplaces, and the list is endless. Sometimes we can be tempted to treat church as gym membership. I applied for my gym membership in January. I've never showed up there till now. The trainer keeps calling me. No, for right reasons, but I'm planning to show up. But you see, People show up in the gym. They have a routine to follow. You're not required to know who is in the gym. You're not required to know how they live their lives. That is none of your business. You're there just to do your dumbbells and jumping jacks and whatever else they do. But church membership, friends, is not like gym membership. While you treat your sermon as dumbbells and giving us jumping jacks, and then you just walk out of the church. No, church membership is more. It is us committing ourselves to each other. It is about saying to each other, brother, sister, I am committed to you as an individual. Even as both of us commit ourselves to each other, we are committing ourselves to live our lives in obedience to God's word. You see, my temptation and your temptation it's always to be concerned about our needs. If you think that is not true, try and think how many times in your prayers you start praying for other people. After a short minute, you take a tangent, it comes back to you. God, I pray that you may bless them so that in the long run they can bless me. You see, first church membership is us saying this. I am committed to these believers. Remember, when we talk about church, we're not talking about the building, we're talking about the people of God, those who have confessed and believed in Jesus and they are following Jesus. These are the people we are talking about. So anytime I mention church, don't think building, think a body, a body, members of one body. So we're saying we're committed to this group, the church, and I'm here to give more than I get. So everyone is here to give more than I get. From the elders, 
to the pastors. Everyone is here to give more than to get. So we are, taking, we are making a commitment to each other in the presence of God and others. Church membership is saying I'm part of a body because you already are. You're saying, I'm not alone. I'm saying, as submitting to these people as they submit to me, to me, to keep each other accountable. You see, when we join a church, we are offering ourselves to one another to be encouraged, rebuked, corrected, served. We are placing ourselves under the submission of the elder's authority. We are saying we are here to stay. And I want you to help me grow in my holiness and godliness as you do the same for me. Will you help me do the same? That is basically what we are saying. You see, sometimes people prefer to date the church, have her around for special events, birthday, weddings, funerals. Have the church around when you feel lonely. Keep her around from some rainy day. But we don't want to marry the church. We want to date the church, but we don't want to marry the church. Remember, the church is not the building. The church is us. Membership is saying, we are transitioning from dating. Friends, we are getting married. Congratulations. You see, different churches formalize church membership differently. But we cannot deny that there is a need for us to be committed to each other. You see, when you read the New Testament, you realize that Paul addresses churches with the word saints. For the, to the saints in Philippi, to the saints in Galatia, to the saints in Corinth. These were believers. These friends were organized churches. They had elders. Paul tells uh, the elders in Acts chapter 20 verse 28... He calls the elders there to protect the flock and to feed the flock and or to protect to feed the flock and to protect the flock against wolves. They were elders. Paul tells Timothy, appoint elders for that church. So there was structure in the church. You see, sometimes people have a misconstrued idea of what the church is. They forget the church is we, the people of God. Sometimes we might easily think, ah, the church is like a group of demonstrators who have gathered for one goal to demonstrate. But you see, no, 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 we are not a group of demonstrators to demonstrate for this particular cause. No, we are believers governed by God's word through the leadership of elders. And there's this mutual commitment to each other. Because the elders as well are members of that body. So the elders don't lead from above, they lead from among us. You see, a group of demonstrators, I don't know if you've ever gone for a demonstration. I've gone for one, just for curiosity. Back then, <laughs> when I was young, I was like, this thing always looks exciting. Let me just go. So I went. You see, one thing I realized about a group of demonstrators is... They are not committed to each other. They are committed to the cause. And everyone has their own reasons why they need that cause to be accomplished. There's someone who has a tender somewhere, and they're thinking, if this cause is achieved, my tender will come through. There's one who is there thinking, ah, yeah, yeah, if this cause is achieved, my child will go to school. So they are there committed for the cause, but not committed for, to each other. Friends, that day when I went for demonstration, when the tear gas canister was released, I knew we were not committed towards each other. It was everyone for himself and God for us all. I'd gone with a friend of mine, a missionary. <laughs> the guy just ran under his car. Phew. No, one, no one was thinking, hey, where is this brother who hid under the car? We came with him. We drove in his car. But no, 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 we are not committed to each other. When the canister was thrown, it's everyone on himself and God for us all. Friends, that is not how church operates. That if one is struck, we go, wow, that is bad. Everyone for himself and God for us all. No, 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 the church, we are committed to each other. 
We are committed to glorify God. But you see, we are committed to this cause. What is our cause as a church? To glorify God. How does God display his glory? He displays his glory through the gospel. How is the gospel displayed? Ah, if you love one another, they will know that you are my disciples. So there's a mutual commitment towards each other. That's how we accomplish our goal to glorify God. And the New Testament, friends, is, is replete with the one another verses. Bear with one another. Be patient with one another. Care for one another. Long suffering. That means these churches, friends, were not perfect churches. And they'll never be a perfect church. Guess what? Because you and I are redeemed sinners. We are being sanctified by the truth. The word of God is truth. It's progressive sanctification. The reason why church exists is so that we can be matured, so that we can be make more, we are being made more like Christ. How? Through the preaching of God's word. How? Ah, through our relationships with one another. And so, this means we have to devote ourselves to edifying each other. That is what discipleship is about. And that's why we are called to practice the one another's of the scriptures. Like, for example, Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says this. And let us consider how we stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Mutual edification can only take place in the context of corporate body. So edification and discipleship, friends, is not something that we are suggested to do. Oh, friends, it is something we are commanded to do. Matthew 28, 19, 20 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything. Is it up there? No. Everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So what is church membership? Church membership, friends, is us asking the question, what task or responsibility and authority does a church member have? You see, sometimes the, the, the danger is a lot of believers can come to gather. You see, I'm even careful not to say coming to church. I'm saying they're coming to gather because it's when we gather, the church gathers, Sometimes we come to church thinking, ah, we have no task to play. We have no responsibility. And that is not everyone. But friends, sometimes we can think that is why church exists. So we have to ask, what, what is the task of a member of the church? What is their responsibility? Do they have any authority? So in other words, we are asking ourselves, what is our responsibility as members of this congregation? That's what theologians call church polity or church governance. You see, the, the, in the scripture, there's this consistent pattern that it is the elders who are supposed to lead, shepherd, feed the flock. Elders are given a responsibility to care for members of the church. That means these members' friends have to be known it means it needs to be this defined group that we know, that we love, that we walk with, who are under our care, the care of elders. The responsibility of elders and pastors is to shepherd God's people. God has called us to labor and to toil for the church, his church, his bride. We are not the ultimate shepherds. We are just under shepherds trying to do what God has called us to do. And that's why Ephesians 4, Paul says, it is the work of elders to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Ah, did you catch it? It's not the elders and the pastors who are required to do all the ministry. They're supposed to equip the saints for the work of ministry. But the elders are not just called to shepherd random flock. They had oversight over a particular people. First Peter 5, 2 says this, and we read, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. In Hebrews 13, 7, the elders are told, 
those who are keeping watch over your souls, as those will give an account. Oh, elders, pastors, we're going to give an account for each and every person who is seated over here. But how do we know who we're going to give an account to? Whose souls are we entrusted with? So that means we need to know who is committing to us and who we are committing to. Giving an account is not just a superficial knowledge of that particular person, but it's their spiritual well-being. Friends, this can't be people that the elders don't know. It has to be people that the elders actually know. Church, this is a weighty matter. This verse sends shivers down my spine. That I will give an account of the people that God has trusted me with. It makes me tremble. This verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, verse 22, 23, that says, On the day many will come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And the Lord will say, Depart from me, I never knew. Those two verses sometimes make me think, God, why did you call me? This is a greater task and responsibility. God will hold us accountable, friends, for your souls. Because he has given us the responsibility to take care of his church. That means we need to know who is the church. We can only give an account to God for the spiritual being of people that we know and walk with. The elders are to give care to those who have submitted themselves to the God-ordained leadership of the church. But what is the task and responsibility and authority of members? Church, we are convinced that the members also have a task, a responsibility, and an authority in the local church. What is their responsibility? You see, Galatians 1.6, Paul is writing to this church that, and there are false teachers that have come inside this church and they are distorting the gospel. They are preaching a gospel that is not salvation, that is not uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. They are putting in works in that salvation. And Galatians 1.6, Paul says, but even if we, who is we here? Apostles. Paul is saying even if we apostles or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached, let him be accursed. Think about it. Paul does not say, Paul is writing to the church in Galatians. Paul is not saying, elders, if someone preached a gospel contrary to what we have preached, let him be accursed. No, no. Paul is calling the church, the members to protect the gospel. That is our task, friends. We are called to protect the gospel. He says, even we, you see, the elders and the members have the responsibility and the authority to guard the gospel. Church, the thing that will make this church, LVC, from moving to a Bible preaching and believing church to an heretical church, it's the members. It's the members who are going to say, no, pastor, ah, that is not true. It's the members. It's not the elders. It's not the pastors. It is a corporate. It is all our responsibility to guard the gospel. You see, friends, probably you're saying, ah, that is far-fetched. Oh, friends, I can tell you of churches in Nairobi that began well that were Bible-preaching churches, but they are no longer Bible-believing and neither are they preaching the gospel. Why? Because the members decided that is only the responsibility of the pastors and elders. And so when any other pastor or elder stood at the pulpit to preach a gospel contrary to what the Bible speaks, the members said nothing. And those churches took a tangent. So that is our role. That is our responsibility. God has given us the authority to keep each other accountable so we can grow together. You see, this is my conviction. I believe if the church, if the leadership of a church 
does not give its members authority to keep them accountable, we are hurting the culture of discipleship in this church. In short, in so many ways I'm saying, I'm so above the pedestal that you have nothing to say about how I live my life. So it becomes in the purpose of elders and pastors to train members through teaching and preaching so that they can use the God-given authority well, so that they can mature in the Lord and use that God-given authority well. So we are saying, yes, members have some authority. You see, two weeks ago, I was having a conversation uh, uh, with a friend. <laughs> and I was asking him, hey, brother, why don't you plug into a church? He said, the problem is church wants to observe my life and my decisions. And me, I just want to come, listen to the sermon, go. And this is what he said. And that's why I like big churches where I go. The pastor does not know me. The members don't know me. I sit at the back. After the service is over, phew, I'm gone. You see, friends, they don't want to give their life to the church. Neither do they want to be accountable to the church. You see, one of the ways that we love and care for one another is through church discipline. Yes, church discipline. Unfortunately, you see, the practice of church discipline has been avoided in so many churches because churches have become man-fearing and pleasing people churches rather than God-fearing and God-glorifying churches. You see, this man-fearing on people-pleasing churches, for them what is at stake is their reputation. For the God-glorifying and God-believing churches, what is at stake, friends, is God's glory. So church discipline is for us restoring the believer. Now I agree there are some churches that they have done this thing wrongly. That it shouldn't be done that way. You see, church discipline, friends, it's an act of restoring the believer. It's an act of love. Even the Bible says God disciplines those whom he loves. Church discipline is the process of correcting sin in the life of the congregation. You correcting my sin, I correcting your sin. So the goal of discipline is always redemption, restoration, protecting the members, guarding the gospel, and honoring the name of Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, 4, 5 says this, when you assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus, the story here is of this gentleman, friends, who was living in sin in 1 Corinthians. The Bible says that he was having an affair with the father's wife. Then Paul says, hey, listen, the church in Corinthians, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord, the church, an assembly, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that this spirit may be served in the day of the Lord. I want to go into the weeds of the interpretation of that, but I'm going to do it later. But here you can see there is an authority for the elders to discipline this brother. Our responsibility towards each other is to say, for example, if I'm found in sin, or Brother Victor, I've found Brother Victor here in sin. I need to ask, Brother Victor, do you understand that the Bible is very clear that this particular matter is sin? So we are asking you as a church to repent and live in obedience to God's word. And this is not a self-imposed authority, it comes from Matthew 18, 18. Observe with me, truly I say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. You see, this verse has been abused, and it has always been about binding the devil in a spiritual warfare and losing that Range Rover so that it can come to you. Not at all. This is not the purpose of this verse. These verses are about authority, and I'm going to show you guys in the next few minutes here. It's about authority that has been given to the church. God gives us the authority to say, brother, sister, that is sin, repent. But how do we do that if we have not agreed in what we believe? 
if we don't agree on how we should live. And that is always according to the scriptures. Friends, that's why we are saying then we need church membership. Because church membership is us basically saying we agree and we know that we are committed to each other. And that God has called us to live faithfully. And where there is sin, God is trusting us to say, Ah, brother, ah, sister, you're living in sin. Called to be accountable to one another. Church discipline is a means of guarding the gospel. You see, when my kids are misbehaving, or your kids are misbehaving, we discipline them, not because we hurt them, because we love them. Because there's something they're misrepresenting. They're either misrepresenting the, your values or the values of the Bible. When someone is dismissed from their job because they misrepresented the standard of conduct and the reputation of that organization is at stake. So friends, when we don't exercise gently, lovingly, biblically, church discipline, God's glory is at stake. In short, we are saying God does not hate sin. God is not holy. And when we do that, God does not get the glory. Oh, friends, God hates sin. You see, Matthew 18, 15 to 17 says this. Jesus outlines the way the church is to seek restoration of a believer who has fallen into sin. He says... One, remember, this is not just, just the work of the elders and pastors. It's the work of the members, the body. Jesus has given this authority to do so. Let's observe Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If this brother refuses to listen to them, tell it to, here's the clincher, the church. Not the elders. Tell it to the church. So the big question is, who is the church? And that's what we, we, are, we are addressing today. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, because Gentiles and tax collectors were not, were, were not part of the family of God in the Old Testament, because the Jews were the family of God. He says, treat him as a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. You see, notice the Bible does not Say, take him to the elders. He say, take him to the church. You see, now why we are making an argument, then we need to know who the church is. We need to know who is committed to us and who we are committed to. If the church members have this final authority, then friends, we cannot risk and assume that everyone who walks into this building is part of the church. They might not be believing in Jesus, So you see, there are many forms of discipline. There is formative discipline. Formative discipline is where you discipline through instruction. This can happen in Bible studies, um, you know, preaching. You know, when you are, you are reading a book with a brother or sister and you call, you tell, it's basically discipline through instruction. It's like when you tell a child, no, no, doing this is wrong. Now, sometimes what African parents do is not formative discipline. Don't you dare try me. You don't want to know what I'll do to you. That is a threat. That is not formative discipline. Formative discipline is giving an instruction that this is wrong. But in Matthew 15, 17, this is what is called corrective discipline. And the process here is clear. When a brother sins, he's to be confronted privately by a single individual. Friends, if, because you are part of one family, if a brother or sister sins, if Victor, for example, sins, or if I sin, I'm supposed to go to Victor and tell Victor, brother, you have sinned. If Victor repents, that is it. Or let's avoid the temptation that if Victor has still repented, ah, I go to um, uh, Amolo here and say, Amolo, did you hear that Victor sinned? 
You know, the brother has already repented. If Victor does not repent, Jesus says, now I go take Michelle and Gloria. We go to Victor. They are my witnesses. I tell Victor, brother, you have sinned. Now I have witnesses, not witnesses from Sitam. No, 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 no. Witnesses of this body. Because we are one family. I take Gloria and Michelle and say, Michelle, and let's go to Brother Victor. I, we go to Brother Victor and tell Brother Victor, you have sinned. Now, if Victor says, yes, indeed, I've sinned, that ends there. If Victor says, no, and he continues to live in sin, I tell Victor, no, I have no option, brother, but to take you before the church. Because Victor has committed to the church. You see now why it is important for us to know who the church is. Now, if Victor does not listen to the church, this is what is called preemptive discipline. We tell brother, now based on how you live your life, Victor, we cannot affirm that you are a believer. We can't tell. Because you say you are an unbeliever, but how you're living your life is actually contrary to God's word. You see, it's like when I'm taking my daughter to ride a bicycle. Sometimes she says she's riding a bicycle, and both her and I, we can see she's not riding the bicycle. And I keep thinking, riding means pedaling, pedaling, push, go. Dad, I'm riding, and she's at a constant speed. She's not constant speed, same destination. How I define moving for me, it's moving from one area to another. I don't know how she defines moving. But you see, friends, if then Victor is not living in consistent with God's word, their Bible, God requires us to tell Victor, brother, we cannot affirm that you are a believer. God's name is at stake. You're living as an enemy of the cross. Now, this kind of discipline requires prudence and wisdom, friends. Of course, we still want Brother Victor to come to church so that he can hear the gospel. But sometimes wisdom and prudence needs to be exercised in some of these sins, because dif- there are different cases. But you can see it is the responsibility, friends, of the church. And so if we don't know each other, if we are not committed to each other, friends, the truth of the matter is, some of us might be living in some serious sins, and yet we can't walk with you, we can't encourage you, we can't rebuke, we can't correct you. Oh, friends, that can also be me. I might be, I might, I might be, I might be struggling with some serious things, but because we have not formally committed to each other, I can say, yeah. You see, when I meet with Elder Ruben, old Elder Cart, and they ask me questions, hey, Brother Joshua, how is your marriage? You see, I tell them out of respect, not because we have committed. (laughs) Out of respect, and they're my elders, I sit in the elders. But you see, there's nowhere where we have said when Brother Ruben asks me a question. And that is not how it, that's not exactly, I'm just giving us an example here. But there should be something more that I know Ruben is actually accountable to my life. That my wife can go to any elder and say, elders, This brother pastor, what he preaches on the pulpit, anything he says, I cringe back there because he's not living by his words. Friends, that is always my fear as well. When my wife is preaching in the pulpit and I'm preaching, sometimes I always just look at her so that I can know, okay, um, am I practicing those things? And if I'm not practicing, then I should start practicing. It is our responsibility. So I'm convinced, friends, that it is our responsibility to take care of one another, to covenant with one another through our testimonies, share our testimonies, and how we get to hear these testimonies, then we can affirm, ah, okay, Victor is a believer. Okay? You see, it can't be based on assumptions, friends. 
The government does not assume everyone in the country are their citizens. True or true? True. No, you need to have an ID. We need to identify you as a citizen. How do we do that as believers? When we walk with one another and we have the testimony of that brother or sister, not only what they profess, but what they practice, then we can affirm, ah, Michelle, she's a believer. She's our church member. That's what we are saying. Now, how we do that, the form and the how, that can always be discussed. But the need to do so, I think that is important. You see, my brother and I, we are twins. Both of us have wives. But my brother cannot come to my house and start demanding my wife to submit to him. No, my wife did not covenant with him. My wife covenanted with me. <laughs> because we have agreed with my wife, in the presence of God and men and women who came to that service that beautiful afternoon. And we said, my life I give to you. Everything I own is yours. I share everything in sickness and in health, in good times and bad times. We have covenanted together. So that means my wife has the right to question anything and everything that I do because we have covenanted together. That's what's expected from a church, us, to be committed to one another based on what we believe the Bible says. You see, our greatest temptation then is to assume we believe in the same things. You see, sometimes you can always believe that simply because anyone is seated over here, that we actually believe in the same things. Oh, friends, you'll be shocked. Now, I'm talking about the fundamentals. There are things we can disagree on, which are secondary. Ah, do you believe tongues exist or tongues ceased. I know I believe they ceased. No, I may believe they exist, but how it is practiced, it's very important. Okay? These ones who do not believe they exist, theologians call them secessionists. These ones who believe it still exists, theologians call them continuists. And then we argue, ah, okay, we can disagree on that. But we can still be a member. But you see, friends, if there is someone who questions if Jesus is God, Ah, we are saying, we cannot say you are a member of LVC. Because if you say Jesus is not God, that is a fundamental doctrine. If Jesus is not God, it waters down what the gospel is. Because the gospel is God taking the form of man and dying for us. You see, the assumption is for us to always think we believe in the same thing. But that's not true. And so why, the reason why I'm saying I think it's important, we know it's important to do membership or we believe so, it's because we actually want to know what do we, do we believe in the same thing? Now, if you're here and you're not a believer, please keep coming. We love you. We care for you. But the truth is you're not part of God's family. And I want to send this invitation to you on behalf of this local church. Would you trust and place your faith in this Jesus today? Because Jesus, in your place, he stood condemned. Jesus came and died for you. He bore your earth. It was not his. He was innocent. But when you believe in him, you are treated just as if you never sinned. God calls you a saint, and then join the church. Yeah, you're already in the building, but you have not joined the church. But when you serve, when you repent and you get saved, you're joining the church. So I'm sending you an invitation to actually join the church, the body of believers. So friends, our role is to guard the gospel. And I think we do that through... No, I know rather we do that through our commitment with each other. So church discipline, in short, allows the members to examine each other and affirm that indeed one is a believer based on how they walk and talk. So you see, friends, to put such a weighty and sensitive matter in the hands of people that we do not know if we believe in the same thing, it's detrimental to the life of this church. 
This is what I always tell elders and staff. My greatest fear is 10 years from now or 20 years from now, I don't know where the Lord, probably be home with the Lord, probably I'll still be around. I don't know if I'll be at LVC. It is only the Lord knows. But I'm like, for example, let's assume 10 years or 20 years from now, God has called me to pastor another church. And then I get to hear that ah, the saints at LVC do no longer believe in the gospel. That will break my heart. But how do we do church discipline? Galatians 6.1. If, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Oh, how, how churches have failed to do this. So why do we do church discipline is to guard the gospel. How we do the church discipline is to display the gospel. So why do we do church discipline to kind of to guard the gospel? How we do it is to display the gospel. Or oh, we want to treat Brother Victor in such a way that even as we guard the gospel, we are displaying the grace of the gospel to him. This means the people of God, to do all these things, again, they have to be known. They have to be committed to each other, disciple one another. This is what is happening. Now, do I believe this is happening in this community? 100%. I believe so. I'm convinced with no shadow of doubt that discipleship is happening in this community. If there's no discipleship and commitment, <laughs> home groups will cease to exist. Men's ministry will cease to exist. Women's ministry will cease to exist. And probably the youth will not be coming as well. I believe this is happening. We have no doubt that there's good happening in this body, and we hear testimonies of it each and every day. We know, friends, there are members who have given their lives and time for members of this body. We know there are members here who have stood with people who lost dear ones, and we surrounded them with love and care. Oh, God bless you, church. We are very aware of that. But we are also saying, yes, that is happening. Yes, that is true. But there are people who might be doing these things assuming they are believers and they are not. We might easily mislead those who are not believers to think they are part of the church because they are doing these checklists, but they have not believed in Jesus. They are not committed. And we are also saying, if we are already doing these things then, can we just commit to each other formally? It's like when I was dating my wife, I've come, coffee, walks, all those things that people do when they date and when they still get married. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things only happen on this other end. They happen on both. But you see, it reached a point, I said, can we commit by actually covenanting with one another in the presence of God and other people? Now, how we do that is different. You can go to the OG, AG, commit there. You can come to the church, commit there. In your traditional wedding, commit there. The how and the form, but there is a need for the commitment and saying we are covenanting together. I am your husband and you are my wife. You see, sometimes... We want to be part of the church, but informally. We don't want to be known. We don't want to be known, neither do you want someone else to know you. But friends, God is calling us to be more than that. And like I've said, I've seen that in this local church. Because we are members of one body. So my prayer is, even as I bring this to a close, are we willing to submit our lives to each other and live in line with God's word, choosing this plan that God has for the church, his bride, that the church exists for one thing, to glorify God. How we do, we do that? By guarding the gospel and displaying the gospel through our lives and our doctrine. So my prayer for us is that we examine our hearts this morning. 
Let's think through our lives. In what areas are we struggling? Now, each and every one of us here, plus me, there is a sin that we are struggling with. Can you go to the Lord and confess of your sin? Can you walk to a home group leader or member and tell them, oh, brother, sister, I've been struggling with this sin. Are you accountable to someone in this local church? Not just in your, by name, but do, do they know you? Are you accountable to the elders of this church? Do they know you? Or do they just know you by name? Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your faithfulness. We are grateful for who you are. Lord, you have called us to live for one another and ultimately to live for you. And so, God, we pray. Uh, we know there are so many areas that we have not pleased you. Uh, we have lived in sin. God, we come to you praying that you forgive us our sins. You say that, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess our sins to one another. So, Father, we pray that you are going to forgive us the sins of lust, gossip, slander, and many other sins that, you know, um, that we find ourselves doing. Help us, Lord, to have a desire to pursue you, to pursue holiness. Help us to have a desire as a church to be godly, to care for one another, to care for the members of this body. Help us, the elders and the pastors, to have a genuine love and desire for your church. God, we pray that, Lord, you're going to make us what you want us to be. Transform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Please stand as we sing the response song, which is a prayer that the Lord would build the church and make us strong.
I would like to remind everyone that, uh, especially the new people, that we have a welcome desk. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for anything or have or uh, get information about the church, there will be a prayer uh, space to the left at the back for anyone here who would like to have prayer or be um, prayed for. We'd also like to welcome you for chai and coffee and mandazi. They've become a little bit famous. You might have to beat off some children in order to get yours, but they'll be there at the back, and we, we welcome you to join us and get to know somebody while you're there. Let me close with this prayer. May this day bring Sabbath rest to our hearts and our homes. May God's image in us be restored and our imagination in God be restoried. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slow down. May I know Christ to embrace my own finite smallness in the arms of God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed us and his spirit lead us into the week and into the life to come. God bless you. Sorry, sorry, I have one more announcement. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Pastor Joshua just told me and I completely forgot. Um, those of you, there might be some of you who still have questions about the idea of church membership and it's, it's a bit of a sensitive issue and I think there have been a lot of strong opinions. If you still have something you would like to contribute um, in terms of your thoughts and your opinions, the church is open to your suggestions and your concerns. Um, if you would like to send those in, please email the church and ask for it to be sent to Trish, who will receive those comments. Thank you.